All right, Alexander, we have very, very strong numbers coming out of the U.S. economy. I mean, the jobs numbers were just out of this world. Manufacturing, very, very strong. Say what you want about Trump to all the people on the, the neoliberal left, the liberal left, the crazies at MSNBC, the loons at, at CNN, all the triggered Hollywood actors and and all the all the soy boys and and women wearing the you know what hats out in the streets say whatever you want trump is killing it when it comes to the economy alexander give us the breakdown as to what's going on with the u.s economy well well you you, you missed out one particular group which is of course uh, certain economists i mean i can remember paul Krugman coming along Krugman coming along and saying you know when trump was elected you know we're going to be in a crisis it's all going to fall apart well it hasn't fallen apart i mean trump's uh, trump has presided over very very strong economic numbers i mean last year 2018 the u.s managed three percent growth now that is huge for an economy of the size of the United States. I mean, that is extremely strong growth coming out of, uh, coming on top of what has been a long expansion since the 2008 uh, uh, financial crisis. And I don't think there's any doubt at all as to why we see this strong growth. It is because he ran a very, very uh, 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 big stimulus with this very big tax cut that he promoted um, when he became president, and I think that's given a lot of, uh, uh, you know, I think that's turbocharged the economy, and I think he's also done all kinds of other things which have probably helped. I mean, increases in defence spending. I might not agree with them, but for other reasons. But I think they're probably good for the economy, and of course these, these infrastructure programs yeah, that he's talking about. regulations, yeah. and exactly, and, and ter- exactly lower reg- regulations. So all of this. Is, is is leading to some very, very strong economic numbers. And, of course, it's the sort of things, I mean, manufacturing and jobs are the parts of the economy that Donald Trump cares about. I mean, that's his heartland. Those are the people who voted for him. The people who voted for him uh, that he really cares about are those people who, are, you know, are, are, are the beneficiaries of this expansion and of those jobs. I am going to add one qualifier, and this is really not to do with Donald Trump at all. One of the problems, the big problem in the United States, is that the financial system has got too big. And the weaknesses in the U.S. economy and we saw the, how the stock market almost crashed at the end of last year and how there have been wobbles this year. The problems are not with the underlying manufacturing economy. They are in the financial system, which has piled on debt and which is very resistant now to even the smallest interest rate increases. And I think this is going to create more and more problems down the line. But this is not something that Donald Trump is responsible for. It goes back decades. And the people you need to look at and criticize for that are the Federal Reserve. It's the central bank, which has been running very, very loose monetary policies for far too long. Well, Trump criticizes the the Fed often. And and I think the big million dollar question that I have on my mind is, will this growth last? Will it take Trump all the way to 2020? Yeah. And if it does, I think that it's a pretty safe bet that he he's going to take the the presidency for another four more years. Or do you think uh, the economic growth may hit a snag? In which case, it may hurt uh, Trump's tra- Trump's no, chances think- for re-election. No, I, I think there was a very strong chance that it would that it would fall fall away um, at the end of last year and the beginning of this year when the Federal Reserve Board was uh, um, in an interest raising interest rate raising cycle and was uh, um, um, unwinding its quantitative easing program and i think those very tight monetary conditions in conditions where as i said the unit the federal reserve board has itself uh, um, created far too much debt in the system and far too much liquidity was threatening uh, 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 the ongoing expansion 
uh, and push, could have pushed the economy into outright recession. Um, what has happened over the last few week, uh, last few days, uh, last week in fact, is that the Federal Reserve Board, coming under enormous pressure, both from the business community and from the administration, the Trump administration, has now pulled back, and we are not getting any further interest rate rises and any more unwinding of quantitative easing or any more monetary tightening. Now, that may create problems. In fact, I, 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 I'm going to say it is going to create major problems further down the line. It's a very bad thing, but it means in the short to medium term that the econo economic expansion that we are looking at is going to continue, and I predict it is going to continue right up to uh, 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 the 2020 election. So I, I, I think this idea that some people had that, you know, we're going to get a recession and that this is going to be the end of Donald Trump, I don't think that's going to materialise at all. I predict, on the contrary, we will see stimulus, we will see gr great ex continued expansion in the United States. We're going to see a major stimulus program in China, which is going to lead to a major uh, 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 you know, economic uh, upswing in the second half of 2019 there. Um, I, I'm going to say, I, I, I've been talking about Russia, steady growth in Russia, the place that's going to look bad at the end of 2019, especially by comparison with the US, is going to be the European Union, which is stuck in stagnation. And when all the major economies, uh, uh, Germany, France, Italy, are probably sure in Trump's recession. Gonna, he's going to make a note of it as well to remind Europe how, how poorly they are doing he's a, he, he, He's yeah, not going to make a note tweet of about it. it. He's going to broadcast <laughs> the fact. He's going to tweet about it. He's going to talk about it incessantly, as he always does. And why shouldn't he? I mean, why shouldn't he point at the fact that he's run, he's 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 uh, uh, running a very strong and growing economy, and the and the Europeans are nowhere. I mean, they can't get their act together. They can't. They, they, their economy uh, it, 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 it is still. Uh, basically unable to shake off the 2008 crisis. I mean, hardly anywhere in Europe now have you seen, uh, uh, um, a, apart from Germany, um, have you seen a recovery, a sustained recovery since 2008, uh, whereas the United States at the moment is powering ahead for, you know, with an economy firing off on all cylinders. Now, as I said, uh, you know, a couple of years down the line, you know, four or five years in the future, I predict there will be problems. But I don't see anything like that yeah, happening at the moment. Of course, the Europeans are, are the ones with their nose stuck high in the air, and they're the ones that are talking down to Trump. <laughs> you know, and they're the ones that are the elite, and the, they're, they're the smart guys in the room. But, but, I mean, they just can't get their act together at well, all. That's right. Meanwhile, Trump is just blowing it out of the water. Well, well that's exactly right. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I have to say, there are... Uh, uh, deeper structural reasons why the United States is doing better than the European Union. I mean, um, I, I think the uh, European economies um, um, would probably not be able to match economic growth in the United States, even in the most optimal circumstances, because, I mean, these are older societies. Um, there, there's less... Um, um, vitality, if you like, or dynamism, if you like, in these economies than there is in the U.S. economy. Um, but, I, you know, having said that, conditions in Europe are far from optimal anyway. There are major problems about the way the European Union is being run. And until and unless those are addressed, which I personally doubt they can be, with the European Union structured as it is at the moment, we're going to see this growing divergence between the United States, which is doing very well, and a yeah, Europe that is going nowhere. Yeah, the European Union to me is a, it, 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 it's a large social list. There are many countries that are just have very, very big um, public sectors, and they're, and they're plagued with yeah. a ton of corruption, just a lot of corruption. And when you put those two things well, together... It, you know, the, a country just can't go, yeah. can't go anywhere at all. What, 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 what do you make of of the one big Achilles heel, I think, of the U.S. economy 
and I'm, I'm asking you to, to kind of probe if, if this is really that big mm-hmm. a deal and that's the, that's the U.S. Uh, uh, deficit. Yes, I, I mean, I think I, I think the deficit is not the Achilles heel in and of itself. I think the debt is. I think one must separate the question of deficit and debt. The United States can finance for the moment the deficit, the budget deficit that it has. It can finance the uh, um, s- uh, trade deficit that it has. I mean, bear in mind, it's got the reserve currency. Um, the problem with having the reserve currency is that, of course, it tempts the United States to print dollars to cover these deficits because it knows it can. And as a result, you see a kind of complacency uh, arising. And with that, as I said, there's a, there's a growing growth of debt. And the debt of the United States is, is soon going to be above 100% of GDP, which is pretty unprecedented in peacetime and of course the uh, banking system having been bailed out in 2008 um, is also busy churning out debt because it too thinks it can they they all think um, that if any problem arises the federal reserve board will step in and will pay all the bills and if it doesn't have the money to do it it will just print more of it well, it's, it's historically and done you that, are finding well, it's historically done that, and it's, you know, but I mean, you know, that's that's the trouble, and you know, that's that's what people think. And in fact, you now have some people who are talking about something called new monetarism. Uh, 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 Ocasio Cortez, you will not be surprised, is a follower of this uh, of this idea, which is basically that you could just print as much money as you like. <laughs> and that that's what the United States should do, <laughs> and that presumably, I mean, you take into an extreme. You know, why, why bother, why bother to tax or borrow when you can just print the money? Uh, I, 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 I'm taking it to extremes, of course. But um, at some point, that party has to stop. You can't just go on printing money and borrowing and creating debt uh, like this. Um, 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 People like Mitch Feinstein, who is, uh, uh, you know, um, a, f- a head fund manager, uh, but uh, who understands the way economies work, um, has been writing about this in books like uh, uh, Planet Ponzi. Uh, Michael Hudson, who is an economist, has also been writing about this um, also. And I think, you know, put aside people like Krugman, who I, I, I think are just, frankly, uh, I, I think they've lost it. Uh, I mean, he, uh, it, it's people like Feinstein and Hudson that you need to look at if you're worrying about the future economic, the, the, the economic future of the United States. It remains a huge, immensely productive economy. I mean, we've talked about the Russian economy in the past. The U.S. dwarfs the Russian economy. Um, it, China is the only big economic competitor. The United States, however, remains not just a big economy, but a very dynamic one. But it is not managing its monetary policy well. It's, uh, uh, and because it is not managing its monetary policy well, you see these things happening with, uh, with the deficits that are starting to grow, um, um, both with the budget and with, with the trade surplus. So I think there will one day come a day of reckoning, but it won't happen before 2020. And in the meantime, I predict this economic expansion Is Trump the guy to, to put the, the U.S. House in order with, uh, with the spending and the debt? I don't know. I mean, it could happen. I mean... Uh, Trump, I mean, he's Trump got, is an he's got the balls man. to I do mean, it. He, he, he's got the balls to do it. There's no doubt about it. He's, he, if, I, I don't see him doing anything right. about it before 2020. If he's real, if, first of all, he's got so many other problems. I mean, he's still got the, the Russiagate nightmare to get off his back. But you know, if he's re-elected in 2020, um, he might actually, um, at some point, address this problem. Because I think another point I haven't made. But perhaps it's an important point to make is that, of course, if you print money and you increase debt, those kind of policies ensure that money trickles to the top. 
they create growing inequality because money that isn't earned turn, tends to end up in the ha in the hands of those who already have it. And to the extent that the United States has been getting more unequal, a much more unequal place, a far more unequal place in the last couple of decades, I think it's less to do actually at the moment with the uh, tax policies, which people have been complaining about. I think it's much more to do with the way monetary policy is being run there. And of course, if you again listen to people, you know, like, you know, proper economists, having such slack money is creating all kinds of bad investments, it is encouraging bad investments. So I wonder whether, for example, the move towards electric cars or, or to shale oil and gas would have happened on quite the scale it has if monetary policy had been tighter and whether those investments are quite as sound as some people seem to think they are. So um, I, I think that if, if Donald Trump, who has had uh, um, work in some, you know, shall we say more, he's more in, been more involved in the real economy. I mean, he comes from construction rather than finance. Um, he, if he sits down and thinks about it, um, he may understand that this isn't actually for good for the long-term future of the United States. He can see that in the work that, you know, in his own businesses. And he might he might do that. And if he is re-elected in 2020, um, he might have the political momentum behind him, exactly, to fix it. But I have to say, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a colossal job. I mean, we're talking about a much more difficult challenge in some ways than mending relations with Russia, the thing which has got him into so much trouble. Because, of course, there are so many people who are benefiting from the current system, and that would mean taking them on. But, you know, we'll see. I mean, certainly, and I think this is an important point to stress, if Donald Trump doesn't do it, at the That's moment, there's no one else. My thought exactly. Will. If, if Donald <laughs> I mean, Trump's I mean, not the one to do it, I, mean, I can't I, think of anyone who will have the guts to. Yeah, I mean, I mean as I said, I mean, uh, and I mean, you, you made some sharp points about European welfare systems, but I mean, Europe, European welfare systems can sometimes actually act as pretty good economic stabilizers. Um, what alarms me, as I said, when I look at the left or some people on the left in the United States, like Ocasio-Cortez, is that they seem to think that you can have European-type welfare systems and not have to pay for them, and that this new monetarism is the way to do it. It's not. <laughs> there is no such thing in economics as a free no, what lunch. unnerves me about Cortez, Ocasio-Cortez, and all these people that are, that are promoting these, these large social states and yeah. they think they're they're this you know cure all kind of um, government uh, yeah. idea government structure is that they yeah. never factor in the human factor in all of this and that's corruption. I, well, you well, know the, the the idea. Okay, that's great. Health care for everybody. I that's that's a great idea, and that's a great thing if you can pull it off. But once you get yeah. corruption in there and people in the government who go into these funds and start dipping yeah. their hands in them, which is inevitable. It's inevitable. Well, indeed. Then the whole thing falls mm. apart. Well, well I, I, especially in a system like the you know, well, in the United States, where we've seen how corrupt the political system in the United States can be. But I mean, you know, I, if I may say so, I mean, talking about, as I said, printing money to pay for these programs it's is going to compound, compound the problem, problems exactly. of corruption <laughs> that, 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 that you are talking about. I, I, I think that. Um, you know, people like her uh, uh, need need to wake up and uh, you know take some lessons because um, um, I, I don't think this is going to work at all. And I think if they go down that road, that route, um, they will they will not only make things much worse in the United States, but some of the collapse that people have been talking about the the you know the U.S. collapse that people are talking about might even actually happen. So uh, you know, I, I I think we've got to be clear about this um monetarism uh, of that kind loose money is not the way is not the way forward and uh coming back to what 
to, to, to our original question, um, it's either Trump at the moment or no one, because none of the people who are appearing as potential challengers to him seem to be remotely uh, uh, um, up to seeing these problems. Whether Trump himself will, I don't know. And so, I mean, my, my point on all of this is you said that loose money ends up usually in the elite, in the very wealthy of society. I'll, I'll, I'll even take that one step further, Alexander, and I'll say that loose money not only ends up in the hands of, of the very wealthy, the, the Jeff Bezos and these guys, it also ends up in the hands of the politicians as well. And that's the part that scares me. You know, well, once you have loose money, the politicians are also dipping their hands in. Well, of course it is, because it's unearned. You see, uh, 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 money that's made productively through factories and people working, uh, not just in factories, in, you know, in, 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 real, in real jobs and work, it, it is by, by, it's almost by its nature going to be much more evenly distributed. Whereas money that's created in this way, that's printed in this way, always ends up at the top. And you're absolutely right. I mean, it is, you know, if, you want to, if you want to understand why people like Bezos, you remember how many years Amazon went by without making any kind of profit? Over 10, Amazon 15 could, years. Exactly. Amazon, Amazon, Amazon could not have been created in the way that it was without the kind of uh, uh, support that a loose money system creates. And I have to say, I mean, I, I don't buy the idea that uh, that was the only way of creating internet, um, you know, internet shopping. It would have happened anyway. It, it just happened that the way in which it was done benefited Jeff Bezos and people like him. And um, that's, I think, something that people who care about the United States and the economy of the United States need yeah, to I think about very carefully. And I also agree with the fact that, you know, if, if Trump doesn't do it, I can't think of anyone else that's going to take on such a colossal task. Yes, but on the flip side, he can't even get yes. a damn wall built. So, I mean, if he can't get the wall built, well, that's I don't right. how, how you can tackle the, the U.S. debt. Well, that's right. I mean, the one thing I'm going to say is this. If he's re-elected in 2020, it will presumably no longer be possible to say that he is the agent of Putin. <laughs> and with all the political problems that has caused him, at which point, hopefully he will be in a much stronger position to move forward with his policy agenda. The only thing I would say is that four years, which is all that he'd have, is not a very long time to turn a thing like this round. But we'll see. Anyway, uh, coming back to your original questions, I think that, as I said, we will continue to see this expansion at least until 2020. Um, I think that will give... Donald Trump, a lot of momentum going forward into the election next year. None of the uh, none of the Democrats that have been put up look very impressive people to me. If he's reelected, we yeah, will see what good he can point, do. Good Alexander. And uh, I hope you're right about the Russia thing. But, you know, <laughs> if he does win, I wouldn't be surprised if they say that, you know, Putin tipped the scales well, in mean, the I mean, election as well. <laughs> I, I, I mean, some people will continue to believe yeah. that, ir irrespective of whatever happens. But I mean, I, I, I think it will be very difficult to persuade anybody, uh, uh, anybody who has two two cells, two gray cells, two brain cells, to rub together that that happens <laughs> well, twice. <laughs> I mean, it seems to me two, two brain cells to rub bizarre. together. I don't, I don't think you're going to find that at CNN, MSNBC, and, and pretty much half of the Democrat well, Party you, well, as well. So. You're going to have a lot of people well, you know, there we go. Well, there you know, we believing go. in the Russia Gate version 2.0. <laughs> God, I'd hate to think what would happen, okay. the Trump derangement that would happen when he does win in the in the 2020 elections. My God. Oh, oh I mean, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, well, I, I hope, actually, it creates a crisis within the... It would create a crisis within the Democratic Party because it needs it. I mean, to be absolutely clear about this, uh, the party of FDR and uh, uh, John F. Kennedy right, and Lyndon Johnson would never exactly, I mean, would not have behaved like this. So, I mean, you know, it, 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 if we start getting some more serious people in charge of the Democratic Party and they start thinking more intelligently and, and the media also, uh, then maybe 
we can start dealing with these problems in the deep state, because we haven't talked about those it on this program, the, the intelligence services who are out of control. And also maybe, you know, as I said, we can start to see Donald Trump actually doing some things to put his actual agenda into Another practice. Another colossal problem that needs to get solved, that's for sure. Yeah. Alexander McCurse, Editor-in-Chief of the Durant, thank you very much. Guys, if you like this video, click on the subscribe button down below and click on that notifications bell to get notifications every time we push out a new video. And visit the Durant shop, pick up a t-shirt, help support the Durant. And in the description box down below, you'll find links to our PayPal and Patreon pages. Please donate to the Durant. That also helps us out a lot. And of course, you can get a copy of this video in audio format on iTunes and SoundCloud. So follow us there and go to the Duran.com and read all the articles that Alexander is linking up to. Alexander, thank you once again. Until next time, take care.